Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful autumn, summer, Sunday. You know, we're in a transition. A beautiful day nonetheless. Uh, we're going to start off with a song here called Creation Sings, which is set to a tune you may be familiar with. Processional hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Spirit of the Lord, there are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet. hearts and praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place you may be seated welcome welcome good morning welcome to first united methodist church my name is joe rossiter and it's really a pleasure to have you in this place where God has gathered us today. A few announcements. 
Join us Sunday, October 3rd for a hymn sing following the 1015 service. We will, we will uh, sing for one half hour and share opinions on whether to have a regular hymn sing. A reminder that Pastor Trevor will be joining us again on October 3rd to lead us in celebrating World Communion Sunday. Please come along and, and join with us. There will be a special Simpson homecoming service on October 24th at 1015 in Smith Chapel on the Simpson campus. The service will be in place of the 1015 service here at the church. The service will be led by a combination of First United Methodist Church and Simpson clergy and musicians. Registration is now open to sign up your fourth grader to receive a Bible on October 31st during our fourth grade Bible presentation. Come join us that Sunday to celebrate an important milestone in the faith journey of our children. Those are just a few of the announcements, uh, some of the things that are going on here at the church. See your bulletin for even more announcements. Now would you please stand, uh, if you are able, and uh, greet one another as we've been greeting during this time by a wave and a smile. <laughs> please remain standing if you are able and join me in our opening prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the way your Holy Spirit moved among and filled the apostles with your presence. We've always known that you go with us wherever we are by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to remember that church is wherever your people, empowered by your spirit, dwell. Thank you, God, for always being with us. Amen. Would you please remain standing and join us in our opening song found in your red hymnals on 2148 or on the screens. This is a song we don't, haven't done too often, but I'd like to do more. It is just a good time and a good song. This is Over My Head. I hear music in the 
And when I think of Jesus, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Our first reading this morning comes from the Common English Bible, Psalm 133. Hear these words. Look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. It is like expensive oil poured over the head, running down onto the beard, Aaron's beard, which is extended over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, streaming down onto the mountains of Zion, because it is there that the Lord has commanded the blessing, everlasting life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A bulletin change here. The special music featuring the chancel choir will occur next week. We'll continue on to the next scripture. What Zach is saying is, is I'm, I'm the backup for the choir. Sorry about that. It's good to worship with you all today. We will be in the Acts of the Apostles this morning, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a longer scripture reading than some Sundays, but this is a story of an event, and so uh, uh, we'll share together. This is the event of Pentecost. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like individual flames of fire already on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard the sound, A crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native language. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, For again, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the region of Livia bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles, and he raised his voice and declared, Judeans, And everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord, the Lord comes. And everyone who, will, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Well, this is a, a, a great uh, passage of Scripture. There's a lot of, of great sermon material here. You could preach several different sermons. There's a, a whole uh, sermon that I have preached on occasion about um, God calling all people to ministry, uh, whether you're, you're young or old, a man or a woman, which can be you know, based easily out of the verses 17 and following. But today we wanna, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit, and I want to talk about uh, virtual worship, and also how that relates to the theme of this month, which is our, my sermon theme, All In. Probably the shortest sermon title sermon theme I've ever had, All In. And particularly today, I'm thinking of our, of our worshipers who are worshiping with us virtually on uh, Facebook Live this morning or will watch uh, our, the video of this service later. Uh, we're so thankful for your presence worshiping with us. You know, as we look at worship and what it means to be uh, the people of God worshiping and being all in, it brings us to the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in the church. When we first started this whole process over the last number of months of worshiping online and worshiping different ways, it was all extremely new to us. It was all difficult to comprehend and to figure out how we might how we might do that together when we started out we started out very simply uh, just recording worship off of an iphone and broadcasting it as best we could and we recognized that we were worshiping in a new and different way no for most of our life as christians most the exist of our church we have thought about worship really as in-person worship in our sanctuary. And yet we know that people worship all over uh, the place, all different venues, and really when you think about it, online worship is a venue, just like our sanctuary, just like when we were doing contemporary worship uh, in Parish Hall. It's a venue for worship. It's a location for worship. But it's not one we had wrapped our brains around previously. In fact, at one time we weren't even sure if we could really do that or not. A number of years ago, a couple of our United Methodist congregations in the U.S. asked the Council of Bishops if it was okay if they tried to do online communion. The bishop's first response was, the usual response of the church, we've never done it that way before. We don't know what we think of that, And so they did some studying, and then basically they kind of decided, oh, we don't really think it's a good idea because for us, most of the time when we think of of worshiping together, we believe that communion is best done in in the presence of each other worshiping. So that you should know as a United Methodist pastor I'm not supposed to go back to my study on Sunday morning and get some communion elements and just bless them by myself. I do not have magic hands. I don't make something be communion. The Holy Spirit makes it communion. And, the whole, and usually the intent is we do that together. I lead because they, the church has designated that United Methodist elders lead communion to make sure the liturgy is, is followed, to make sure that we don't skip stuff that's important. But we do it together. I'm really not supposed to do it by myself. And that was kind of the principle on which that first decision was based. But circumstances often cause us to to change our practices. Circumstances cause us to change our practices. We got into the pandemic, and we realized, and our bishop realized, there is no way for us to commune together following the rules we've always followed. And so Bishop Laurie Haller, our resident bishop, wisely said, we're going to make an exception. And she used her authority as bishop to give the church's permission in extremis during this time to be able to offer communion online. I would say that I hope that actually that that permission extends maybe forever. Because we started to think about what does it really mean to be present? 
We have often thought being present means being present together in the same room. Yet we know the whole church of God, the whole church of Jesus Christ is not always present in the same room. Down the street, uh, uh, on the opposite corner from us, our Presbyterian friends are meeting, and at different times of the day, our, our Catholic friends down the street are meeting, and the Baptists are meeting on the other corner, and we're not in the same space, but we're worshiping God, and we're communing and doing things. As uh, was mentioned in the announcements, Pastor Trevor is going to lead World Communion Sunday on October 3rd. I love that Sunday because it's a reminder that around the clock, Around the globe, as you go through the different time zones, on a Sunday, Christians around the world, no matter what their denomination, no matter what their church background, throughout that 24-hour period are sharing in Holy Communion. That the sacrament is being lifted up hour by hour by hour by hour. And it reminds us of the unity that we are supposed to have in Christ that we often don't think about. And so the bishop recognized, and other bishops around the country recognized, this is too important to allow ourselves to lose communion because we don't want to change something. Because we wouldn't want to change something. Well, when we look here at the Holy Spirit, I believe the actions and work of the Holy Spirit relates a lot to the idea of being all in as Christians. It's important to be in worship on Sunday, whether you're here and here or, or you're, you're online with us or, or uh, worshiping in some other way as you travel or do other things. It's important to worship God. But being a Christian is not just gathering once a week on a Sunday or whatever day and then going about your business the rest of the week. That was never Christ's intention that we would be a one-seventh Christian, or even two-sevenths a Christian, but that Christianity, the Christian faith, the teachings of Christ, should affect our daily life and our daily walk all the time. And the recognition that the Holy Spirit, God's presence, is with us all the time is really important to that. Because if I need to learn to behave and act as a Christian, to live ethically and morally and biblically as a Christian, to be good to other people, to share the love of God, it's going to help me a whole lot that God is with me all the time. By the way, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I would confess that Methodists don't like to talk about the Holy Spirit that much. We really don't. We're just a little bit afraid of that Holy Spirit thing. You don't know what might happen if you get the Holy Spirit involved in something, you know, and there, there's uh, plenty of jokes about that. Maybe we visited churches that had very different worship styles or, or, or uh, participated in, in glossolalia or what people call speaking in tongues, and we were a little uncomfortable because it's not our style of worship and, and weren't sure what to think. And so we maybe uh, connect Holy Spirit with, with um, uh, a different kind of worship or a different way of being. And yet the scripture tells us that the Holy per- uh, Spirit is the third person of the Trinity is intrinsic uh, are to our faith. Uh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Our paraclete, as one translation says, comes from the Greek word parakletos, teacher. By the way, the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, not just a force of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an it. We use he, or you may even use she for the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, one of the words for spirit in the Old Testament is she, it uses she, uh, uses a word that's a feminine word for the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's not an it. If you've ever watched the star, any of the Star Wars movies, there's this, this pervading thing that uh, people manipulate called the Force. The Holy Spirit is not the Force. The Holy Spirit is God working in all of us, God being with all of us, so that while we're worshiping here and another church is worshiping around the corner, it's not like the Holy Spirit has to hang out with the Methodists for a few minutes and then jump to the Presbyterians. The Holy Spirit's in both places. Though I did have a Presbyterian friend who used to tell me he wrote his sermons early so that the Methodists could have the Holy Spirit on Saturday when they were writing Saturday night specials. I didn't like that, but anyway. My, my sermon's done before Saturday, by the way. Um, so so there, there's just, the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. It's God working in us. 
and God helping us to be what God wants us to be. Now, in some of the ways that God wants us to be involves us working each day to, to share God's message in new ways. Um, in, in Acts, second chapter, that, that section, Pentecost Day is considered the birthday of the church. It's the day that uh, God used a moment, a time, to share the gospel with a very small group of people that ballooned, mushroomed on that day into a much larger group because it's the Passover, post-Passover, Pentecost time being celebrated, and you've got the Pentecost festival, and they're there, they're hanging out for this time in Jerusalem, and so you have people in Jerusalem from all over the world for much more uh, than maybe some other times uh, during the year, and you had people from all these different countries. I try very hard not to give a lay reader uh, this passage, particularly if they have to read about uh, the uh, the Parthenites, the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians, the Judeans, the Cappadocians, the Pontians, the Asians, the Phrygians, the Pamphylians, and the Samsonites whose luggage is so nice. No, that's not actually in there. Uh, there's a lot of words in there that nobody, you know, that, that are hard to pronounce. So if you ever do have this passage given to you, I'll tell you a secret. Read through it out loud. Say the names with confidence, and even if you pronounce it wrong, 90% of the people or more in the room won't know you did because they don't know how to say those names either. So, so just read it with confidence. But people are from all parts of the world here, and in those moments when Peter got up to preach, he was preaching to a, a group of people from the church, which was the only church in the world, meeting in the upper room, of 100 people or less. We have more people in this room than all the Christians that ever existed at the beginning of the morning of Pentecost. The entire church in the world. Peter got up to preach and got a chance to preach to people from all over the world. And when that day ended, there were 5,000 Christians. And those 5,000 Christians, most of them who didn't live in Jerusalem, went back home and started to share God's love and the new experience they had had through the grace of God on, on Pentecost. So, when we think about worship, and we think about virtual worship, which we've only been doing online uh, for a certain number of months, one thought that you could have is, well, when all this stuff, this mess is over, should we just, you know, all make sure we all get together in person all the time? No, when we talked about online worship, we realized at one point that this had to continue, not just for now, but that we need to offer this opportunity of worship forever. Why? Well, first of all, we have always known we have members of our congregation who can't always get here in person on Sunday. We have an opportunity to offer to people in the church worship, whether they can be in this building or not, no matter what the circumstances. We haven't talked about it, Zach, but I'm willing to bet our worship is never going to exactly get snowed out again. Somebody can get over here and we can turn on the camera. Um, if the weather's bad enough that I can't get from the parsonage to here, y'all don't come, okay? But watch me online, because I can get across the street. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to be able to worship no matter what the circumstance. It's also an incredible outreach opportunity to be able to easily invite people to worship. It's never been easier to invite somebody to worship and say, hey, Here's a link to our Facebook page, or here's the church show website. The, the video will go up there for the day's over, those kinds of things. And, and you can see how we worship, and you can worship with us. But it's also a reminder of that something that the church does that we don't think about doing. And we don't always honestly enjoy doing. The church, are you ready for this? The church, oh gosh, hold me back. The church changes. Oh gosh, that's a four-letter word in church, isn't it? The church changes. Now to be honest, lots of times we don't really want to. We're very comfortable with who we are, and it's hard. Change is hard. But historically, the church has always changed. We have adopted new ways of worshiping over the years. If you go back throughout the history of the worship of the church, we are not sitting here worshiping in Latin. We are not using the same liturgies and the same prayers entirety that would have been used. It's shifted and changed as the needs have arose. We have modified our music 
uh, uh, offerings over the many, many years to worship in new ways. When I was the associate pastor at First United Methodist Church of Cedar Falls, and they celebrated an anniversary, we learned that near the early part of the church founding in the 1800s, that they had a big, huge fight in the church over worship. They had brought in this newfangled thing called a church choir. And they were doing what they called back then promiscuous singing. Do you know what promiscuous singing is? It was singing music that was not a, a, a psalm. Some people believe the only music that should be sung in church is the psalm, based on the psalms. And they were bringing in, you know, hepped up, rocked up things like Amazing Grace for Pete's sake. I don't know if we can have that kind of thing in church. And so the first Sunday that the choir sang, a portion of the congregation walked out on them. You know you're having a bad day as a preacher when your congregation gets up and walks out, by the way. It does make you feel more akin to John Wesley, but still it's not a good thing. They worked through that. They changed, and last I was at First Cedar Falls, they got a great choir. And like us, they've got handbells and other things that would have been called innovations. The way we dress for worship has changed. When I first started pastoring, uh, been over 30 years ago now, the pastor I worked for expected me to show up on Sunday and each day of the week wearing a necktie and a, and a jacket. Now, I confess I don't mind jackets, and I don't even... Yes, I do. I mind neckties. I hate neckties. I, I like how neckties look, and, and I know some of you wear some really snazzy, great-looking neckties, but I've often wondered why I need to walk around during my day with a noose around my neck. Most of us don't wear a necktie anymore. It's not actually necessary to the Christian faith. We, we have changed times of worship. We've changed venues over the years. We've built new buildings. We've done new things. The church has always changed. And even though sometimes we don't want to, there's a secret about change that you need to know. We will change whether we want to or not. The choice is whether we try to make strategic changes when we have opportunity or we let, just let stuff happen to us? What if we had decided that we were not going to get one of those newfangled cameras and put it in the church, and we weren't going to allow uh, staff to, to broadcast worship on cell phones because, by golly, that's a new thing? I mean, it wasn't as if, honestly, Zach and then Brian and myself and Ellen wanted to spend the middle part of our week tinkering with video that we've never done before. We did it because we needed to do it. And we still need to do, do it in its own way with, with a now dedicated system. What if we had not been willing to change? Well, there would be no worship at all for several months. It would have been horrible. It was tough enough, right? It was tough enough not being able to gather. But it would have been unthinkable. I can't even imagine. I think about the pastors who pastored during the Spanish flu epidemic when there was no internet and, and little, you know, not really telephone service. And it, the ministry must have been so difficult. And yet the church changed and survived and thrived and moved on. And so the Holy Spirit is often a guide in change. I'm thankful for our bishops who wisely, at first, wanted to study communion and make sure we don't change something just to change something, but then when the need arose said, we have to let people commune online so that the body of Christ can gather around the Lord's table. We have to do that. It's actually been kind of fun for some of you to tell me what you've used as elements on Sunday morning. I had one person tell me they went to the fridge and had nothing that was bread-like, and they, they used uh, an, egg, an egg roll for communion that morning. We, we chuckle about that. But, you know, the way we do communion and have done it uh, traditionally, I hate to tell you this, but Jesus wasn't using King's Hawaiian bread in communion, though I love that stuff for communion. So we, we've changed and we've learned some things. 
And part of being all in as a Christian is recognizing that God is with us and working with us and being with us all the time, even in difficult and trying circumstances. Even when we're not really sure we want to change, but we know something has to change. Even when we're not comfortable, the Spirit is there with us. The Spirit is there with us, helping us to be more like Christ. In both communion and baptism, we together ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, bless these your people and these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Or we, we bless the water and ask God to bless that water and use it and then we lay hands and I do on your behalf the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and spirit you may become a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. We know that God's Spirit is with us and that's a good thing. Because when we leave the house of God, it's true we're not supposed to start living as, stop living as Christians. In fact, really when we leave the house of God is when we're supposed to start living as Christians. But it also means we are never truly alone. I can't imagine what it must have been like for the disciples when Jesus ascended into heaven and they were left standing there with their, eye, their mouths kind of hanging open wondering, what now? What was Jesus thinking? He just got resurrected and we hung out for, for a, a good while and, and doggone it, he decided to go back to heaven and he changed stuff. What do we do now? Jesus said, wait. Wait here. Wait here. And I will send the Holy Spirit, the teacher, the paraclete, who will guide you each step of the way after I'm gone. If you remember, not long ago, I preached out of, um, out of Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission from Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And um, the passage there says that, that we are to make disciples of Jesus Christ, right? We're supposed to go, baptize, uh, make disciples. But towards the end of the passage, it says, And lo, I am with you always. Until the end of the age is one of the ways you can translate that. It can mean until the end of our life, until the end of this present creation, until the end of, of all that we have to do. In other words, in all of this, Jesus promises that because all power and authority has been given to him on heaven and earth, that he's going to be with us forever. When I think about virtual, I think we have a lot more in common with the first century than we think we do. For those of us who didn't grow up, uh, who aren't natives of the digital generation, it may feel really like we're separated when we're worshiping online. But our, our younger adults know how connected they are to their friends and how they can communicate with their friends across nations and across, across borders. We have learned that God can be everywhere and is everywhere. If you remember the Jonah story, you remember when Jonah tried to run away from God? He had this strange, bizarre idea that if he crossed the Israeli border, he could get out of God's jurisdiction. Like if you uh, thought you could, uh, were, were running from a police officer in Iowa, that you could run across the border in Illinois and get away. By the way, that doesn't work. They're allowed to to chase you further. They have agreements for that. But pe they, people at one time had the weird idea that God would be only God over a certain country, and if you wanted to another country, it was a different God. We know that's not true. We know that there is one God, and we all worship one God, and however people are trying to worship, they're trying to worship the one God. Jonah found out that God didn't have any jurisdictions and that uh, God was everywhere. At that time, he was a bit chagrined at the idea but look at what God did in rescuing the people of Nineveh. We are growing to recognize 
that God can lead us in ways we've never thought, through means we would, would, have, would have never imagined, in, with, in venues we would have never known God would create. And so now, the church is virtual. And that means it can go everywhere, anywhere, all the time, any place. And we can carry it there because God's taught us to change for the sake of the gospel. Paul said, I will be all things to all people, that Christ may be all in all. May it be so. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship in person and virtually. And even when we leave these buildings, when we leave our homes, when we leave our apartments, when we go to work, when we go about our business, when we go on vacation, when we leave the country, wherever we may go, if we were to launch into space with SpaceX, you would still be there with us. Help us, Lord, to go all in by remembering that our faith isn't just for today. It's for every day in the mighty and glorious, loving presence of God. In Christ's name, amen. So just to kind of uh, give, you, give you kind of a heads up as we change again, we will be singing a song of reflection here, a hymn of reflection in a moment. And then we are going to share an offering by the passing of plates, which we started last week. This will feel like a novelty after we just uh, started this up again. But um, I'm sure you'll, you'll remember and catch on in no time, right? And our ushers will lead us, and then we will do something we haven't done much of lately. We will share in a doxology together as the plates are brought forward and we seek God's blessing on our gifts. Sometimes the old is new too. Let us worship. Church of God united to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts in glad accord. Christ ever goes before us, we follow day by day. With Serve
This time our ushers are going to come and collect our offering. Offering as an act of worship. Give as Christ leads you for the upbuilding of God's church. for these gifts being given in your name and for all the ways that people give whether it is here in this worship service in this place or online or however they choose to contribute knowing that they help us all to share God's message around the world bless us Lord bless your people bless us this morning as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn this little light of mine. Here we are. Yeah. 
this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All through the night. All through the night. I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night. I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, 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 one more time, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Indeed, Lord, let our light in Jesus Christ shine. Send us out in your love. Help us to experience the power of your spirit. In Christ's name, amen.